Um, um. Now there's teachers and lawyers and business executives and they all wear shiny badges and they all reject the state. Okay, so the shinybadges.com people reject the state. How nice, says the average person. So, you're a bunch of anarchists. Who would build the roads? Yada yada. I've always thought a much more effective ideological position is to reject acts of aggression and harmful fraud. You can almost further summarize this as just being against acts of aggression. People have been rejecting the state for so long that it just sounds cliché. Strident, bravado-ish, maybe even insufficiently specific. I tend to think the more specific you can make a grievance, the more people you can turn against it. Well, against the source of your grievance. I understand that there are special treatments being given to bureaucrats here, that they don't have to go through the metal detector, but average people do. Is that true? So here, for instance, at City Hall in Keene, my grievance back around 2012 or 2013 was that bureaucrats were getting special treatment and they were being allowed on the second and third floors of City Hall without a metal detector check. Well, pretty much all average people were forced to go through a metal detector to get up there. Well, I could have showed up here and complained about the state existing, which would have gotten me nowhere. Or I could spew my questions about taxpayers being forced to underwrite this discriminatory policy. With the latter approach, it's just harder for all these bureaucrats to treat me as a non-human. It also gives you a chance to divide the better bureaucrats against the worse ones. A chance to get some of them on your side. So for instance, I called the mayor about this concern, talked to him about it on the air on a radio program, and because the state was imposing the metal detector sort of against his town, he agreed with my position that this shouldn't be going on. At least part of it shouldn't be going on. I'm sure there are many other cases where the state would support one of our liberty positions against the authoritarian of Keene. By focusing on a specific, reasonable concern, you can get more people on your side, you have a wider variety of targets to pick from, issues to pick from, you can keep it from being as personal. Why is it that you guys don't have to go through the metal detector, but I, I and average citizens do? Um, because we have ID tags. Could I get an ID tag without being a city employee? No. You need to be an employee to get a tag. So do you feel uncomfortable getting special treatment like that? I don't think it's special treatment. I'm an employee. <laughs> so, although I might have other concerns about some of the people in this building, Asking this question is not necessarily being against them. Hopefully it's fairly obvious that there is an activity that I'm opposing. It's better to oppose small groups than large ones, better to oppose individuals and groups, and better to oppose, to oppose individual actions than to oppose an entire person. It becomes a sort of civic surgical debate strike. Ultimately, of course, what would be even better would be to follow our Buckminster Fuller's advice. He used to say you're better off instead of fighting against something, you create a competitor to that something that puts it out of business uh, by offering a superior alternative. And you know, I really don't have much in the way of ideas on how to appropriately do something like that. The problem, I guess, is that it's probably risky to set up any kind of alternate government in New Hampshire. It comes with the danger that this alternate government would just become an additional layer of oppression. Kind of the way homeowners associations have evolved maybe over the last 20 or 30 years in the U.S. Just an additional layer of government. As if six weren't enough. Or maybe it's five, I lose track. So, I don't know, maybe the least bad solution is to apply the same laser-like approach toward fixing problems that is, uh, that is appropriate for pointing them out. Um. What are the characteristics that mark good activism, efficient activism, liberty activism that doesn't wind up being like this? 
I'd say there are roughly 10 characteristics that mark efficient activism. Ow. Ow. You wouldn't hit on all 10 cylinders every time, but the more of them that you can hit, the better. Two, three, uh. In no particular order, ideal activism for liberty features good demeanor, sustainability, appropriate location, i.e. New Hampshire, and to paraphrase the German rebel von Stauffenberg, a reasonable chance of success. It inspires follow-up activity, or is itself follow-up activity. It recruits movers to New Hampshire. It gets attention. It generates more popular support than opposition. It creates change. It, isolated or it isolates or divides our enemies, generates revenue. It flushes authoritarians out into the open, or as Gandhi used to say, it makes an injustice visible. It directly makes life better for someone. It actually is pro-liberty, makes us look good, costs little time or money in proportion to the benefit. Probably it would be safe to say that if a piece of activism hits on half of these cylinders and doesn't hurt anybody, it's probably good activism. I'd like to go into more detail and kind of show some examples. Let's start from the bottom, from the very least efficient, most wasteful activism, which of course is still better than no activism, and then we'll work our way up to what I think is some of the most efficient and impressive activism I've ever seen in the liberty community. This is what the least effective, peaceable activism looks like. It looks like this because you didn't get any video of it. Or, I guess I should say, whoever was doing it didn't get any video of it. Or, maybe I should say, it looks like this because it never happened. The second worst freedom activism looks a little more like this. There is some sort of visual record, but it's a visual record of someone no one recognizes standing behind a podium and talking. Or it's a picture of what mainstream photographers call Bopsa. Bunch of people sitting around. Again, lots better than nothing. This might sadly be the form that most activism takes around the country. People meeting outside New Hampshire, talking and listening. To be really weak activism, it, it pretty much does need to be outside New Hampshire. Then there's this, not sure if it's worse or better, running a National Libertarian Party candidacy, not even in New Hampshire, jumping right into that black hole that the federal government has set aside for you, doing the type of work that the U.S. system is designed to absorb and dissipate. After that, maybe you graduated to doing something similar except on a local level, expending half the effort to get the same zero result. A step above that would be doing something that's actually quick and easy and visual in an attempt to free some place that's not New Hampshire. At least you didn't have to put weeks of effort into it. If you stood in the right spot for an hour, you probably got seen by a couple thousand people and one in ten chance you made it into a local paper to be forgotten later. A step above that would be doing the same sort of thing after signing the letter of intent that you'll move to New Hampshire. Whoops, wrong shot. There we go. How you doing? Doing fine. What's DHS? Department of Homeland Security. He's trying to save California before leaving it for some reason. The fact that they're free staters at least makes it easier for free staters to talk about them. It may not physically bring them under our umbrella that they're free staters, but it, it uh, makes it easier for them to garner support from free staters, of whatever type that might be. Then there's out and out textbook civil disobedience outside New Hampshire. Well, actually in this case it wasn't textbook. 
this is a free stater, Lauren Canario, getting arrested in Connecticut for sitting on a porch that was about to be imminent domained. Don't think it was really planned. It has to be textbook civil disobedience. It has to be planned. But this one hit on almost all the cylinders except for location. It got a lot of media attention. It mobilized a lot of follow-on activism. Popular support for her was high. But ultimately, I got the impression that uh, I got the impression that she had ultimately second thoughts about the location. She moved to New Hampshire not long after this. But so far, hasn't done anything here that was uh, as popular as this one. Maybe it's hard to be David without Goliath. Rich Paul, Lauren, and Richard. But at least the constructive troubles she got into here happened within easy range of our support infrastructure. If you have to be outside New Hampshire, this kind of thing is also pretty useful. The Ron Paul candidacy did happen everywhere, really in the world, in a sense. One person could make a difference. This cameraman technically was a Romney supporter, but he documented the electoral abuses with his camera. I know I focus a little too much on video and how good or bad it is. There were many other things done behind the scenes in this campaign where one person made a difference and uh, you and I never heard about it. But ultimately all these folks, including me, were trying to move a mountain with a lever. Levers actually are useful for moving boulders off the top of the mountain to make it a little shorter and start an avalanche. That's why I have to give an honorable mention to the folks who at least move somewhere for more freedom. Like Wyoming or Ireland. There at least you get a little bit more freedom and you can start trying to move that boulder probably more or less by yourself and unnoticed. At least you're not moving a mountain. I assume you're not doing completely inefficient stuff as mentioned before while you're there. Now, Here's where activism starts to get a little more efficient, even if you're getting most of it wrong. Location, location, location. These end justifies the means occupy folks aren't even particularly pro-freedom, but choosing Keene as a place to take activism at least guarantees they'll get attention from the growing New Hampshire Liberty Press. Which in turn does breed, ten, you know, tends to bring more activists to New, New Hampshire who support the human rights of these occupiers. Here's some weak New Hampshire activism that at least is in New Hampshire. I was so eager to get into the fight that not long after unloading, I headed straight for the nearest intersection that had an IRS office in the general area. This didn't get much done, but at least it hit on the efficiency cylinder. Didn't take much effort or time or people. Actually, I should probably stop here and come to grips with the fact that I've probably skipped over some good examples of bad activism and some good types of bad activism, some, some types of bad activism that are worth mentioning. And maybe I should think a little bit more about all the cylinders upon which activism needs to hit, ideally ought to hit. So there are three cylinders I didn't think of initially when I was naming all the possible cylinders that the ideal activism would hit on. Those would be uh, that the activism unites activists, it displays courage, it strikes the root of a problem. Courage, of course, is less and less important the more successful you are. We don't need near as much of it to do stuff in New Hampshire that would require superhuman courage if you did it in North Korea. It also requires more courage to do something in Keene, I think, than it does to do it in Manchester. And I guess a fourth one would be it displays good timing. I kind of suck at that one. But 
Well, now that we're up to probably about 14 cylinders, I guess I will try to list them all in writing in the video description. It's a very serious question, so I would like a very serious answer. Do you feel as commissioners that you are above the law? Uh, here's an example of what I'd call mixed activism. Uh, the guys at governmentoversight.com. They, they've got the most important thing right. They're in New Hampshire. They're getting a lot of video, putting it up on YouTube. They seem to be focusing pretty much like a laser on the, the uh, I guess it's the lakes region. Or at least the guy who shoots most of these videos does. I keep an eye on what they've uploaded, sort of, but I don't really watch their videos much or comment on their channel much. I did post one comment and it said this. Are you ever going to aim that camera at anything interesting? All right, 10 seconds. Oh, yes. Actually, they are. Here they are, aiming something, aiming the camera at something interesting for two minutes. The same shot. No other shots. Now, this is kind of normal behavior that a person would be expected to engage in if they just own a cell phone or something. But I've seen their rig. It's probably worth almost as much as a house. If you're going to get a really good video camera, I'm not even going to say you have to shoot good video, but at least shoot interesting video. They're mostly failing to hit on the gets attention cylinder. I'm glad someone is recording these government meetings. What we're doing is we're collaborating, sharing information, sharing data. If, if, if that, I mean, uh, it's a public meeting. It's, it's a not, public it's meeting. Not, it's not a public it's, I root for these guys when they come under attack. And uh, when they do, the video does get interesting. You don't have that. You, don't, you can't say what you're doing. Is this your meeting? meeting? You're getting it's paid by the public. It's an open house. Uh, another cylinder that they hit on is the uh, sustainability cylinder because they've been doing this a long time. I don't know how they do it because their efficiency cylinder is completely misfiring. Well, almost completely. I liked Sam Dodson's approach a little bit better. Dodson made the same mistake of buying much more expensive equipment than uh, could ever be considered efficient for a, a relatively amateur videographer. Everything's big in Texas, and true to form, Sam had a way of kind of overdoing everything. He never got very good at handling the camera, but at least he filmed things that were interesting. So unlike the government oversight folks, Sam sometimes went viral. He spent way too much time over-editing his stuff. He was courageous, way more than me in terms of standing up to the authorities anywhere. But it only took him about two years to burn out, and he left New Hampshire. Spouting nonsense, or maybe good sense, about extraterrestrials. Oh, I guess that should bring me to another cylinder he was misfiring on. There is no patient identity at risk here, sir. I'm filming an EMT, and you will not tell me to turn the camera off. He wasn't very good at making us look good. He was always getting angry, overstating his powers, but the beauty of being in New Hampshire is the more of a train wreck you seem like, the more attention you get. And attention breeds movers, even if it's mostly negative. I keep needing to remind myself that I'm probably focusing too much on people who are attention whores, like me, and I should speak a little more to the efforts of the, the unsung heroes, some of which I don't even know what they're doing because they're so unsung. But uh, a good example of activism, I think, is sort of a step above what Sam was doing, is the uh, drudgerous task of bill reading. The New Hampshire State House is sort of like the tip of, of our spear in government circles. That's where we've had the most inroads. And I tend to be a believer in that old the Soviet doctrine that you reinforce success, you don't reinforce failure uh, in a military sense, or in our case, in a, in a peaceable conflict sense. I read a couple of bills, you know, reviewed them uh, for the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance uh, and decided that was not for me. Uh, now, though, I think, uh, you know, almost every bill that comes before the State House gets read and reviewed by a Liberty Alliance member. And those fo folks don't get the glory 
like us YouTube jockeys. Better still uh, would be the folks who run for office, whether they're free staters or whether they already lived here and believed in freedom. That is a really efficient piece of activism because it only costs two bucks, and you know, in some cases, people don't really even put any effort into it, and they still win. That's talking about running for state house. Really efficient, depending on where you are, what the circumstances are. Uh, assuming that you can do that, it's probably better to do that than than running for local office. Because again, it's just much more difficult to get into a local office in many cases than it is to get into the state house. And ultimately, if we can get into a position where we regularly prevail at the state house, there's just a lot more power there than the than there is at the local level. A freedom-oriented House of Representatives in New Hampshire could actually, I guess, I should call it the General Court. Uh, freedom-oriented General Court could simply repeal uh, legislation that gives towns their authority to hurt people. That's the kind of thing that would help flush authoritarians out into the open. It would hit on, hit on that cylinder, as well as the efficiency, the in New Hampshire, and the uh, gets attention cylinders. Somewhere in here, I guess I have to give a tip of the hat to folks who have bills submitted. Uh, I've done that a couple times myself. However, I tell you what, it, it made me feel dirty. I don't know if I'm going to ever have one submitted again just because it, uh, it supposedly costs a little bit of money for them to hear and then reject a bill. Certainly, I wouldn't uh, try to have a bill submitted in the future that uh, adds text to, le le uh, to the uh, law. I would, I would only support... I mean, I can really... Uh, basically, you want a, a bill to repeal a law rather than creating a new one. But I do have to admit, when you get a bill submitted, Especially if it gets attention, it can be a very efficient way to uh, either create change or create a debate. But again, whatever you're doing, you want to try and add as many cylinders to it. You know, if you just submit a bill, it might or might not get attention. But if you take the follow-on steps of organizing demonstrations or letters to the editor, YouTube videos, and so forth, then if you can even get press, you can change the debate someone who did both a state house run and textbook civil disobedience was Andrew Carroll out in Keene. Actually, I'm not sure he lived there, but he chose that location to uh, openly possess marijuana after informing the authorities that's what he was going to do. So Andrew pretty much hit on the efficiency cylinder, the attention-getting cylinder, though I would have preferred that it had gotten more attention. And the makes us look good cylinder, it was definitely purely a pro-liberty move. It flushed the authoritarians out into the open. However, he failed to hit on the sustainability uh, cylinder, I guess, and eventually left New Hampshire. Uh, sustainability and people leaving New Hampshire keeps coming up, which brings me to my next piece of activism on the totem pole. Uh, Mike Fisher, uh, he was the one that sort of got civil disobedience started in New Hampshire. So in a sense, not only was he doing textbook civil disobedience, but he was doing something kind of new. And I think for that reason, he, he delivered a, a manicure without a license and was arrested for it. But I think for the, for the novelty of it, the textbook nature of it, that's why he got more attention than uh, most anything else we've ever done in New Hampshire. He was in every, really, every major paper and uh, other media outlet. But again, you know, he, he was a lot like Gandhi. He did a lot of charitable type of activism and so forth. But again, he didn't hit on the sustainability cylinder. He just couldn't, uh, I guess, make ends meet here. And away he went in around 2007. Never to be heard from again. By the way, he did hit on the, what I would call the follow-on cylinder because after he did his deed, uh, a bill was submitted to the state house to uh, try and change the manicuring laws. Uh, that first one failed, but eventually the laws were relaxed. Not sure how much they had to do with Fisher. The best activism I've seen in New Hampshire so far, believe it or not, probably only hits on about two-thirds of the cylinders. And it also happens to be the activism that I sometimes tend to criticize. Maybe I criticize it more simply because it is so effective at getting my attention. It's your show. You can take control of the airwaves toll-free. But that's... Ian Freeman's Free Talk Live operations. Well, they're now, you know, of course, the operations of many other people. 
but none of it would have happened without him. And you will not tell me to turn the camera off on public property. Hey! Fucking asshole! What are you doing? Give me my phone! Ah! That's stealing, sir! I want to press charges against this man! Who is the guy in the hat? The man right there stole my phone. I want to press charges charge against this man. Hold on. Who what is this guy? He's getting I'm away. Right the wall. I have we have all hey, witnesses hey, it's on this camera. Get... Despite all of Ian's social skills challenges, his inability to interact effectively with the bad guys outside his program, the fact that he has hit on the sustainability cylinder, the attention getting cylinder, the flushes authoritarians out cylinder. He was novel when he invented his program. His timing was good. Well, I mean, I guess I should say it's good on a daily basis because he has he can talk about an issue the day it happens. To do uh, to our listeners earlier today, I sent out an update announcing that we were going to have a guest on the show. There's courageous activity connected with his program, often conducted by him. It's in New Hampshire. This is ridiculous, man. You were here last time when I was recording. Sir. His demeanor isn't very good uh, when he's fighting outside his program with the authoritarians. He refuses to even call it fighting, which methinks thou dost protest too much. The most important cylinder he's hitting on, other than the publicity generating cylinder, is probably the, the revenue generating cylinder. I, I think that's, you know, although he's pretty robust, I'm not sure he could have done this for all these 10 years without having some sort of financial reward for it. It's been roughly 10 years. So I tell you what, if you were able to just come along and do kind of what Ian Freeman's doing, but add good demeanor to it, and a few of the other cylinders he's misfiring on, you would probably be the next... Thank you, thank you. And the truth is, we probably can do better than our best. Right now, he's a pretty hard act to follow, though, just because it's, I mean, uh, he's probably getting about four to 500,000 people seeing his activism per day. And that is, you know, some people think I'm fairly effective, but, uh, I mean, that that is a factor of, it would be like a factor of 20 better than how I'm doing. And, of course, in Ian's case, he does a great deal more activism outside of his radio program. I don't do much activism outside the Ridley Report. He's all over stuff outside Free Talk Live. And maybe his many flaws, which he acknowledges, simply make him stronger on the flushes authoritarians out into the open cylinder. Now, in the process of articulating these cylinders on which active, you know, activism should ideally hit, I have not only thought of more cylinders, but I've also realized that there are some pieces of activism that I probably should have mentioned, some types of activism, either because they're excessively bad or excessively good, or they just provide us with insight. But the cylinders I thought of as I was narrating are these. First of all, novelty. A thing should be unusual, maybe not done before or not known to have been done before in this area. And there should be, if possible, good timing. Again, if you look at the video descript, I should list all of the cylinders I've come up with in one place, in writing. 